All right, there's a new book out called 100 Things a Wildcat Fan Should Know and Do Before They Die. 100 Things. Uh, an interesting, fun book here. All the the, 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 the important people, uh, coaches for other teams like Bob Knight, uh, certain legendary UK games, places where those games were uh, were played, uh, the old teams like the Fabulous Five and the Unforgettables, and even super fans like Ashley Judd. Part of the 100 things that Wildcat fans should know and do before they die. And one of the authors of the book, Joe Cox, is with us. He co-authors this book with uh, Ryan Clark. And Joe works, uh, his day job is as an attorney in Bowling Green. Joe, how you doing? Doing great, doing great. How you doing? I'm great. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, where did the idea for this book come from? Well, the idea, actually, I've got to give due credit to the publisher, Triumph Books. They've done a, a series of these, but they're mostly about pro teams, and they wanted to branch out into the college game, and specifically college basketball. And there were two that were released right at the same time. We were the first two. It's Kentucky and it's Indiana. Also, the first two are Kentucky and Indiana, and, and you're going to see this all across the country then? Uh, well, presumably, hopefully. Hopefully, okay. Um, are the people... You start with Adolph Rupp. That's the first thing. Now, that's number one in your list of 100, and it goes all the way to Billy Gillespie, <laughs> who's number 100. Uh, Joe, I'm getting a feeling that there was a method to the madness of the order in which you put these people and events uh, in. Am I right? Well, you, you'd kind of flatter me to think so. Uh, that was the plan. Now, sometimes there was, sometimes we kind of fell into it. I mean, take a guy like Anthony Davis. Uh, in December, he was in the list, but he was in the list in the 90s, and mm -hmm. the longer the season went and the more great games he had, he just went up and up and up. Now, granted, yeah, Rupp was always at the top, Gillespie was always at the bottom, but but there was some uh, shifting around as the, the last season went on. Yeah, you got him. You got Anthony Davis number 15 here on the list of 100 things that Wildcats should know and do before they die. So you're yeah, right. He started in the 90s. Uh, he, he made that big jump, but he ends up, I think he's the second highest player on the list in the end. Uh, so what you got now? Yeah, Dan Essel is eighth. Yeah, you're right. Uh, well, you know, that would make sense because I, and I was talking about this with my son the other night. You look at what Anthony Davis has done in the pros and he even got hurt for a while. And then he comes back right after a concussion and, and, and hit, gets a double double. I mean, I tell you, and I said this on the air and, and I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on basketball, but just to my naked eye, he was one of the most entertaining players I've ever seen play basketball anywhere. Oh, absolutely. A special talent, a guy with guard skills in a, in a center's body. I, I'm very excited about watching Anthony in the NBA. I, I, I sometimes do wish we were watching him in a different era where we'd have a couple more years yeah. of him in Lexington. But, uh, you know, he's at the next level. He belongs at the next level. And if he can stay healthy and, and stay focused, and I think he, he's got a reasonably good chance on both fronts, then the sky's the limit. You just wandered into the subject of my next question. Whether or not now these fleeting stars in one year and out the next, is that going to make it, in your view, more difficult for people to either be loyalist to the team or certainly latch on to, to recent history of the team if these guys are in and out of here so fast? You know, I really don't think so. I wondered that at first. The, the first team I view kind of as the test case and John Wall is one of the the hundred um, you know items in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think between John and Demarcus Cousins, you certainly see that that the Big Blue family embraced them very quickly. I think in the modern society, it's not as much of a jump as it seems. Uh, we've all probably got a, a spouse or a child or a friend who, who's a reality TV junkie. It just makes college basketball kind of a, a reality TV sport. I, I mean, you know, you've got a season with them, and there they are, and then the next season you've got a new cast. And then it hasn't shut down reality TV, so I don't think it'll cut UK down either. Well, that's a good point. Our attention spans are becoming more minuscule anyway, so uh, maybe this just kind of fits along, uh, along into that program. You have Paul Bear Bryant as the 40th thing that all U.K. basketball fans should know and do before they die. He's the only, uh, that I could see, the only thing or person that does not have a direct connection to basketball, or is there one? Why is he in there? That, that may be. Uh, he's in there, and this was one of my favorite chapters to write. Uh, of course, in the 50s, there was that brief era when Bear Bryant coached football at U.K. and Adolph Rupp coached basketball. And, you know, it had to be a great time to be a U.K. fan before my time. But uh, it ended pretty quickly. And the story that Bear Bryant always liked to tell about it was because there was a season when 
football and basketball both won the SEC. And according to Bear, as he told it to Sports Illustrated in the 60s, after the season there was a big banquet, and the U.K. boosters gave Adolph Rupp a new car, and they gave uh, Bryant, I've heard either a cigarette lighter or a watch. I think a cigarette lighter is the version he told Sports (laughs) Illustrated. (laughs) It's a great story, but the only problem was, as I did the investigation, it wasn't true. Uh, Rupp did get a car seven or eight years later for some milestone career victory, but Bryant was long, long gone. But meanwhile, the the interesting thing I did find is a year after the the, the time in question, uh, the governor of Kentucky at the time got together some some big U.K. boosters, and they did take up a collection of money, and they did buy a coach a brand-new car to make him feel appreciated, and the coach was Bear Bryant. Really? Even though though he was gone? Well, he wasn't gone then. No, he wasn't gone then. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's about three or four years between Bryant's big year and him moving on to greener pastures, and... You know, it sounded to me like the the governor and the boosters were doing all they could to let him know that he certainly was appreciated, and they hoped to keep him a long time. But uh, funny how, in time, the story changed. Well, and I guess this was before uh, Bear Bryant could do commercials for Paul uh, Miller uh, and get a and get a car uh, for, without having to you know raise money to go out and buy him one. <laughs> True, different different time, <laughs> different uh, different era. Uh, Joe, can you hang on for a couple minutes? Yeah, sure. Love to do another uh, segment if we could. Thanks. Uh, we got to take a break here. Joe Cox is with us. He, along with Ryan Clark, have written the 100 things that Wildcat, f- Wildcat fans should know and do before they die. Uh, it's an entertaining, but yet it's an informative book here, too. And it uh, pretty much covers it all, although I am going to ask him if anybody got left out and if they would have liked to have put in. And, and how close, I guess, how close was Billy Gillespie to falling off the list? Because he's, he's 100. <laughs> On the list, which, which it probably would be, for Gillespie to be number 100, it, it, it's uh, probably more of an insult to be on the list at 100 than if he wasn't there at all. Uh, people, the fans would probably understand why you wouldn't have him on a list of 100 things a Wildcat fan should know and do before they die. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we'll be back with Mr. Cox here in just a moment. First, back with uh, Joe Cox, who is a co-author along with Ryan Clark of the 100 things the Wildcats fans should know before know and do before they uh, die it's a great entertaining uh, book uh, for UK uh, Wildcat basketball fans that uh, covers in a very uh, encapsulated way and fun way some of the historical people and events uh, that have made Kentucky basketball uh, what it is uh, was it tough to stop at 100, uh, Joe? Uh, did anybody fall off the list, or were you able? Now, I notice in the book you've got little sidebar stories um, or, or, or people or places that aren't quite on the list of 100, but I guess they could have been. Are, are those dozen or so items spread throughout the book, those little sidebars? Uh, are those, were they contenders for the 100 and they just didn't make it? In some cases, they were. Uh, it was a good way to to kind of drop some extra you know, people in or some events in or even some, some places in, uh, in a, in a context that would, you know, link it to something else. I mean, Claude Sullivan gets talked about in the chapter on Kaywood Ledford. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of situations like that. And, you know, we, we had some things that fell off, some things that came in. Uh, I never kept count of how many things we actually considered but it, it was very fluid up until it was sent off to triumph so yeah i bet it was on on page 198 one of these sidebars is wheeler's pharmacy which i don't know i've been tempted to go in there someday just to see who i see sitting around the lunch counter uh, in there it's a legendary gathering place i guess for uk coaches and uh, uh people uh, fans who have connections to the program or something but you guys write in there that uh, other than pariahs eddie sutton or billy gillespie <laughs> dropping it at some point uh, basically all the uk coaches have been there uh so i guess was that an indication that a coach was not endearing himself to the program or if the coach was falling on rough times here they didn't dare go into wheeler's pharmacy you know, I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. I don't think the Wheelers had any real role in it. I think they'd have been glad to have had uh, Coach Sutton and Coach Gillespie at least at the beginning of their uh, tenures to drop by. Maybe, maybe it says something about the uh, the humility of the guys who were successful. Maybe it's blind random luck, yeah, but, or they did, or Wheelers doesn't have a liquor license. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no Wheelers' that? main clientele seems to be. Uh, toward the advancing age, uh, pretty yeah. much most small towns across.
Kentucky have a breakfast counter that's pretty similar to Wheeler's. The, the main difference being, you know, at most of them, Joe B. Hall doesn't pop in all the time or Coach Cal doesn't, you know, drop in to have some scrambled eggs and a cup of coffee in the morning. Yeah, uh, that's got to be an unusual gathering place, though, for the uh, for the old-time U.K. fans and, and people connected with the uh, program. Are we any more crazy, the fan base, of the Wildcats than fans of other schools. I mean, do you have any reference point uh, on that? I mean, if people across the country or, or maybe people who have moved here from other parts of the country go, oh, gosh, these Wildcat fans, I mean, they're nuttier and crazier than fans. I don't know about that. I, You know, your Alabama football fans, I would imagine, are probably just as nutty as, as any U.K. fan. I don't know. The, the thing that seems to stand out to me is just the fact that the Big Blue Nation really doesn't seem to know any borders. Um, in the course of going around and signing books, I'm amazed at how many people say this is for my brother who's lived in Montana for 30 years, but he came from Kentucky and he still follows Kentucky basketball. Or, you know, my, my cousin in Texas who's a, a giant UK fan. Uh, I, I don't see as much of that across state lines. And, and for instance, to, to draw on your, your Crimson Tide analogy, my, my family went down to uh, Gulf Shores for vacation a couple of months ago. And my, my wife and I were laughing kind of the whole time. It was amazing how many times we would see a vehicle with UK all over the side of it or a family with, with UK you know, paraphernalia on it, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, but that that does say something about the loyalty of the fans and how well the program travels. Um, it, because I think you're right as far as college programs. Now, you might look at some pro like football, like the Steelers. Steelers seem to have fans everywhere. The Green Bay Packers seem to have fans everywhere, every part of the country. Uh, but uh, UK UK basketball may may lead as far as college teams that that uh, that travel uh, as far as their fan base. Well, the uh, I think both the fans of the program and the cynics about the program would say that in effect, Kentucky is the pro team here. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are Kentucky's pro team. We don't have a, a major. You know, Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL franchise within Kentucky and UK, you know, for good or for bad, has kind of become the default pro team of Kentucky. Yeah, Bill Kitely is number four. Now that's that's pretty high because I again I am assuming there was some order in the madness here as to how you were ranked. Now for an equipment manager. Uh, I don't know that any other school is going to have a so-called equipment manager that would have been that high on the list, but of course he was more than that, his outsized personality, and he seemed to me to be the kind of guy that a coach could immediately latch onto, and Kitely was going to kind of show him the ropes. Kitely was going to be the first guy to to make sure that the coach was comfortable and and uh, assimilate him to the program. Absolutely. Just an ambassador for the program, for the university, a, an incredibly beloved figure. I mean, his funeral was an astounding event because of the number and the variety of people who showed up. As intense as the UK UFL rivalry is, there was no doubt Rick Pitino was going to be there. Uh, Mr. Bill, you know, he's kind of in a lot of ways, uh, and I hate to put him in a box like this, but he's kind of the Santa Claus of Kentucky basketball. Yeah. He, he has the common touch. He brings it to everybody or brought it to everybody. And, you know, he, he, just as much as Adolph Rupp, he's a guy I don't think you'll see replicated. I tell you what, with the recruiting classes we're seeing that are going to be coming in here over the next couple of years, you guys could probably in a few years write another hundred things. That, hey, that the way suits this program me fine. Going. That suits me great. <laughs> uh, we'll we'll do version two point there, there are always players who you know you look back after the fact and say, man, I wish we could have gotten him in here. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, with with the new guys, give them each a year or two, and uh, and they'll be you know making their own uh, impact in the top one hundred probably. It's a great book, and and I'm a transplant here, and I've been here for a long time, over thirty years, but I didn't grow up 